Okay, and the next speaker up is Professor Maya Mayapan from NASA Ames Lab, um, Ames Research Center in Muffetville, California, USA. Professor Mayapan is currently a chief scientist for exploration technology. He's a member of many scientific societies and also a member of Nanotech International Advisory Board. Um, his research interests include carbon nanotubes, graphene, and various inorganic nanovirus, their growth and characterization, and application development in chemical and biosensors, instrumentation, electronics, and optoelectronics. Today, Professor Mayapan will be giving a talk titled Nanotechnology in Biomedical Applications. Please welcome our speaker. So this is a pointer. Uh, how do you know? okay. pointer? Yeah. This neck and twist. Yeah, but we'll, we'll do this the uh, good morning. Oh, I guess I gotta use the microphone. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um I'm I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh I'm glad to share uh, some of our experience in developing uh, sensors for biomedical applications. Mm, NASA Ames Research Center is, uh, is one of the nine NASA centers um, in the U.S. and we are located in, in Silicon Valley, okay, very close to Google and Intel and about 10 minutes from, you know, Stanford. So there I run a nanotechnology group and um, we have a lot of activities going on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to focus just um, the biosensor activities for uh, biomedical applications. Uh, I also have a uh, um, you know, strong collaboration with uh, uh, Pohang University of Science and Technology, uh, Postec in Korea. Um, I have some parallel activities there. Uh, I have graduate students and uh, 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 in developing a bio field effect transistor. So it's somewhat of a competitive technology to what I'm doing uh, at NASA. There are two competing technologies. Uh, I really don't have any preference, you know, one over the other. Uh, you, know, you treat them like you treat your children. You don't give any preference. But in the market may decide completely, you know, differently. That's a different story. And um, so I'm going to give an overview of uh, all of those activities. Okay. So first of all, you know, what is the criteria for a very uh, well designed um, biosensing system? in the marketplace. Uh, first of all, uh, small size and mass and um, uh, low power consumption, especially if it is going to be a portable unit and if you want to integrate it with a smartphone, um, then it has got to be uh, low power consumption. Um, again, minimal resources, minimal chemical resources and uh, minimal you know, human processing. Because if it has got to go to commercial level at the user level, uh, and if the public has to use it, then you cannot design a system which requires a PhD, uh, you know, for operation. So, um, you know, fairly well automated. Uh, reasonably rapid analysis, so that it doesn't take too long. Uh, negligible false alarms. And uh, if possible, you know, multiplexing capability to do multiple things. But you've got to be very careful because as scientists and engineers, you know, we think, you know, we can design a chip which will do nine things, okay. Um, you know, that's a wonderful goal, but I'm not so sure whether it is a good idea for us to try so hard because, you know, we are not the ones ultimately decide um, everything beyond us, okay. It's not just the marketplace, it's a business development. What it is, is right now actually there is healthcare, at least in the U.S., is so expensive, okay. Everything is done. Uh, you know, by people wearing lab coats and so their salaries are high, the insurance costs are high, so on and so forth. So if you are going to bring something, you know, which is going to do at least one thing right, automated, that alone is going to save costs, okay. But all of a sudden, if you actually, you know, do something which is going to make nine things, okay, the companies may not want to actually push it out in the market because there is not money, you know, to be made. Remember, the companies are there to make money. 
they are not there actually as a charitable organization. So, <coughs> there, are, there are a lot of factors beyond you and me, okay. So, that is why multiplexing is very hard. Uh, you know, if you can make it work, you know, do not feel bad, that is all I am trying to say, okay. And um, so, uh, you know, multiplexing and then uh, uh, reliability is, is, is very important. And ultimately, a technology that is going to allow you to you know mass produce these devices so you can keep the cost fairly low okay so those are essentially the um, uh, 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 the goals okay so the first type of sensor that I'm going to talk about is a nano electrode array um, you know for biosensors so these nano electrode arrays are um, uh, you know, it's uh, using electrochemical techniques, okay, whether it is uh, impedance spectroscopy or cyclic voltometry or amperometry, whatever. And uh, so, people have been using carbon based electrode, you know, for about 100 years. So, why would you want to have another electrode, um, especially a nano electrode? Um, Okay. What it is is the, the, the electrical engineers you know will tell you that um, you know the noise is proportional to the surface area. So, you take a tra traditional micro electrode or macro electrode um, and you have very tiny biomolecules that, that you want to detect and uh, so you have a large area and you have a large noise and you have a very tiny signal. Um, on the other hand you take the same micro electrode and you divide that into so many different nano electrodes. Now, now the size difference between your uh, you know molecule and the electrode um, you know goes down and you significantly enhance you know the signal to, uh, to noise uh, ratio and again you know, there are multiplexing you know opportunities. So, what is it that you can use for materials here? Um, if you think of using single wall carbon nanotubes uh, you know looking at pictures of SEM you always notice that the single wall car carbon nanotubes they look like spaghetti on a plate okay. So, it is very hard actually to have you know controlled electrochemistry on single wall carbon nanotubes you know controlling the size and also putting the functionalities uh, and other kind of things. Even the multi wall nanotubes you know grow like uh, towers uh, and if, if they happen to be fairly big towers um, all the electro all the nanotubes are right next to each other. Um, on the other hand um, carbon nano fibers you know are silicon uh, nano wires or zinc oxide nano wires and if you can grow them nice and vertical okay. And uh, what it is is you have one electrode here and then you have an identical electrode nano electrode um, exactly at a distance apart you know the distance that you choose. What it is is you can do a simple back of the envelope calculation you know for a 50 nanometer electrode the radial diffusion layer in electrochemistry requires that the neighboring electrode should be at least about one and a half micron apart. So, that way these two will act like individual electrodes. If they are any closer together the diffusion layer of this electrode will overlap with the diffusion layer of the next electrode. Then if they all overlap then it will begin to deviate from an ideal nano electrode and all the diffusion layers when they merge then they will behave like a micro electrode. Okay. So, that is the biggest issue. So, I, I, the, I, the vertical carbon nano fibers, the vertical silicon nano wires, the vertical zinc oxide nano wires, whatever is your material of choice, okay. I am not going to argue with you about one versus the other, okay. It all depends on your level of um, uh, you know confidence and uh, 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 you know qualifications, you know how far you have advanced, okay. We have worked. Uh, with carbon nano fibers long enough that we feel very comfortable uh, working uh, with them okay. Um, so, that is why generally I do not enter into academic arguments about one material versus the other because there are there could be compromises. So, the way we do this is is fairly simple. Um, we start out with the silicon wafer we used to do 4 inch wafer now we do in a 6 inch wafer and then we you know deposit a metal film you know titanium tungsten tantalum you know typically like in microelectronics and then we put the catalyst deposition for carbon nanotube growth or nanofiber. Um, so, here we use you know nickel we pattern the catalyst and then we use plasma CVD and then we grow vertical carbon nanofibers okay. And uh, these carbon nanofibers uh, are about 50 nanometers and they are about uh, one and a half micron apart. And then we fill the gap between these nanofibers with silicon dioxide 
using TRCVD. Okay, so th that serves two purposes. One is that you can get electrical isolation between the neighboring uh, electrodes. That's one thing. The second thing also during operation, uh, you know, it has got a mechanical, uh, you know, robustness, so the nanotube actually doesn't fall down, you know, like a, you know, grass on a rainy day. Okay, and. Uh, so, um, so those are the two advantages and then we do chemical mechanical polishing that exposes a tiny bit of uh, 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 carbon nanofiber, okay. Uh, it's like, it's like uh, you know the small whiskers on a teenager's face, okay, the <laughs> hair growth. So that's what it looks like. So if you take a look at uh, a top view of the SEM image, so these white dots that you see are the carbon nanofibers poking out, maybe a couple of nanometers and then it is actually on a sea of silicon dioxide. So this is the one that we package and so you can bring your probes and you can attach these probes. You know the probes could be again depending on the target and depending on what is it that you want to use for a probe. It could be a DNA probe, it could be protein, it could be antibody, it could be aptamer, uh, that anything that you want and uh, so this is a carbon chemistry so you have to have your own protocol to attach the probe. Okay? And, and then you bring your target when they hybridize, um, essentially you can do cyclovoltometry or you do electrochemical you know, impedance spectroscopy. Okay, so this is a nano electrode. Um, well. So I'm going to give you in a couple of quick examples. You know, uh, troponin is one of the um, uh, biomarkers um, for for heart disease. We have done all three: you know, troponin, uh, myoglobin, and cardiac reactive protein. And we have done both the cyclovoltometry and also uh, impedance spectroscopy. Uh, and I'll use the impedance spectroscopy to explain. So the bare electrode uh, is the blue color, and then after you attach the antibody for troponin, uh, that is the purple color, and then you get the impedance um, basically. Uh, in a concentration dependent in, in a impedance uh, for um, uh, for when you bring the uh, in a troponin uh, target and um, so uh, these are various concentrations and the lowest concentration that you see in a 0.25 nanogram per ml uh, itself is um, you know well below what the medical community is looking for and so this is uh, done with the laboratory this thing we have since then done in a, in a human serum and that hasn't been published so I don't have the data yet. With the human serum actually the concentration levels are in a bit higher uh, but not you know, terribly bad but still under the, uh, the limits um, the medical community is looking for. And the next one is a cardiac reactive protein again in a similar um, uh, curves. Uh, um, you know the bare electrode and then uh, after the uh, uh, antibody attachment and then you know concentration dependent uh, uh, impedance spectroscopy uh, uh, curves. Uh, recently um, just uh, end of February uh, a visiting scientist that I had from uh, uh, India you know he finished a multiplexing operation. We have a nine, um, 3 by 3 array uh, I think I have an electrode here yeah so essentially this is what it looks like a 3 by 3, ele uh, three um, uh, uh, electrodes and um, you know with the contact p pads looking like this. Um, so he used the first three uh, for myoglobin and the middle three for the uh, cardiac reactive protein and the bottom three for, for troponin. So we are just in the process of uh, analyzing the, uh, the results. Um, so this is actually the old processing that uh, view graph 4 inch wafer but now we uh, migrated to a 6 inch wafer so we get uh, quite a bit of uh, 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 chips you know from, from each effort. Uh, and in fact uh, you know one without patterning is the one that I brought um, a couple of days ago and gave it to everyone and I'm hoping uh, that she could do her cancer diagnostics uh, work using one of these chips. Hopefully we should be able to give her a, these pattern chips also in the future. Uh, so as you can see uh, uh, this is a one approach for lab on a chip applications. Um, early cancer detection is a potential so that is one of the things that I am hoping to do uh, with uh, Ravi Wan's help here. Um, environmental monitoring it is something that we are working on currently pathogen de detection we have already done things like. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to. Okay, uh, for uh, ricin detection, uh, we have already done the work, and we are also uh, beginning to look at you know food quality monitoring because food quality monitoring in many cases uh, you can convert the problem into water quality monitoring because uh, many of the contamination uh, 
you know, if you take a cabbage, uh, things don't go all the way into the, you know, to the center. And uh, this is what I was told. Okay, so uh, as an engineer, you know, I don't have any knowledge about some of these things. I just learn from other people. So this is more or less like a surface contamination. So what it is, is uh, these food companies, uh, the food processing centers, they essentially uh, do a quick wash using pure water and then they collect it uh, in a wash water and then they do analysis using instruments. So now you take that water and then you do um, uh, use this one of these biosensor chips, okay, whether it is E. coli or salmonella or you know, some other bacteria, protozoa or whatever that you are looking at. So the point I'm trying to make is you can do food quality monitoring essentially by converting the problem into a um, you know, water quality monitoring uh, type problem. Okay. So you can see there are a variety of um, uh, applications for, for this uh, type of uh, biosensor. So moving along that I want to talk about the competitive technology from my Korean group. Okay. And so this is something that I've done in the last three or four years. So in the NASA approach there are two things. You know, one is that we were using an electrode, you know, it's electrochemical. The second thing is we were using a material, exotic material like a carbon nanofiber. Whereas on the other hand, so this is just your simple FET, okay, field of a transistor you know, similar to what we have on our, you know, computer chips, okay. The only difference is in the computer chip, you know, the, 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 the FET we have, the transistor we have is dry, okay. Whereas if you're going to do bioanalysis of any kind, you will be dealing with water or, or urine or, 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 or uh, blood, okay. So this is going to be a wet FET, okay. So in that sense, you know, you have a source and you have a drain, but you replace your standard uh, dry gate you know, with the uh, uh, reservoir area with uh, uh, where you can put your uh, electrolyte or liquid or, you know, whatever sample it is. And then you also, you know, fabricate a reference electrode. Most people fabric, you know, have a reference electrode which is pretty much separate, but in, uh, in POSEC, you know, we have exceptional um, nanofabrication capabilities. So when we fabricate an 8 inch wafer, we also fabricate a reference electrode right on the chip. So it does not have to be external. So we do all of these things and um, the advantages are you don't need to do any kind of labeling and uh, there is no expensive, you know, micro uh, uh, you know, readers. So the way the FET, BioFET works is you have a, a, when you operate it, you know, without any uh, of the electrolyte or any of the antibody or anything, you have your standard current voltage characteristics for a given gate voltage. But now when you attach an antibody and you measure the current voltage characteristics, it will shift a little bit, okay. The electrical engineers will call it, in you know, a threshold voltage shift. And then when the... Um, uh, uh, the target and the um, uh, probe, when they hybridize, there will be a further shift. So this shift will be unique. Okay? It is still important that you do all the surface protocol correctly, so there is no non-specific binding. Okay? So just because you have a wonderful electrode or just because you have a wonderful biofet, that doesn't mean selectivity is automatically guaranteed because you know, if you have a target or if you have a probe which sticks everywhere and then you have a lousy surface in the neighboring area, you are going to have a you know, binding from all over and they may contribute to the current and that may confuse the signal. Okay? So no matter what you use you know, for your diagnostics, it is your responsibility to make sure that the surrounding surfaces are such that, you know, you don't get into the problem of non-specific binding. So that's always an issue, you got to work with them, okay. Uh, so this is a device fabrication, I don't have time to go through all of that, but uh, I just want to point out that right over the gate area, there is a small reservoir, you know, where you put your sample, okay. Otherwise, it's a standard source, drain, everything. What we have here unique is um, uh, the silicon nano wire, okay. So that's what we use for uh, the material. It's not a s silicon thin film like you, uh, you have in your computer chips, but it is a silicon nano wire. But this silicon nano wire is not a bottom up nano wire, it's not grown using catalysts because as wonderful and as sexy as it sounds and you can get a nature paper, I honestly do not think it will any time be viable or technically uh, it's going to be commercialized in God knows how long, okay, because it's very difficult to do it on large scale wafer and uh, 
yeah, it's just a waste of time at this point. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, I don't have the patience. I, I'm an engineer. I, I generally don't pay that much attention to uh, nature and science papers, and um, so uh, I, I like to see something in my hand which I can hold as quickly as possible. So what it is is the top-down processing is much easier because it's very well known. The only difference between the standard top-down processing at Intel and the one that we do at Postec is that one in Intel is thin film. Here we make them into nano wires, and I'll show you how the nano wires look like. Um, Okay, so this is what the nano wires uh, uh, look like. We have actually a couple of different uh, approaches to do. So on the on the channel area, so that is the width going in that direction. We use 10 or 20 nano wires. Each nano wire is like 10 nanometer diameter. Okay. One thing that you got to keep in mind is when you are doing a biosensor and you are talking about a transistor, remember you you are not constrained by Moore's law. Moore's law is for the computer chips, okay? Make it smaller and smaller and smaller. But here, our goal is different. We still got to be able to put one drop of blood, or one drop of urine, or one drop of water, okay? One drop, you know, takes a lot of uh, uh, area and, and, and volume, okay? So we don't need to make the source and the drain right next to each other, like Intel is trying to do today, okay? They could be fairly far apart. Okay, they could be like one micron apart or even a couple of micron apart. But one thing that you got to keep in mind is if you have two microns apart and you have a 10 nanometer wire, it might look, you know, behave like a bamboo pole and it could, you know, it could just flex and or it could even break. Okay. So the students I had at Postec, they came up with a very clever idea. Instead of having these kind of straight line nano wire, they also have a, a, a honeycomb like you know, nano wire. So essentially it looks like a honeycomb, but it, it's not a big deal. You, you know, when you do lithography, you use a CAD drawing, and instead of doing you know, straight line nano wires, you know, they do a, 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 a honeycomb on the CAD drawing, and then you do the etching they can make uh, honeycomb type nano wire. So this is basically not only mechanically more stable, but it also supports um, you know, the supporting surface area is much higher, so it can hold more, more volume of your um, uh, probe and the target and so on and so forth. So that's, that's what the device structure looks like. I think I'll skip all of these things. So um, the first one is in a carcinoma uh, uh, embryonic antigen. So the three curves that I was talking about, uh, you know, the, the one on the rightmost is your uh, standard um, uh, IV curve, and then after you put the um, antibody, uh, and then after you have, you know, the target. Um, so it, the expanded version um, shows, um, uh, you know, these curves in a nice and uh, separate. The sensing limit uh, for CEA that we got using the FET is, you know, 5 atomolar. Okay. I think the sensitivity uh, of the biofet uh, would be higher than the carbon nanofiber electrode. You know, based on, uh, you know, we haven't done a one-to-one -one comparison yet, uh, but, you know, my gut feeling is that this will work um, you know, much more sensitive. Uh, it's also, you know, since it is a silicon base and you can do it on 8-inch wafer, I have a feeling this will be probably closer to the market in Korea faster than the one that I could do in Silicon Valley, okay? Um, so that, that's, that's what I think. And um, uh, we have also done uh, AFP, and uh, I don't have time to go through all of these things. And a um, couple of things that, that I want to talk about, I, I, I won't have time to talk about things in detail. So far, the biomedical application that I talked about is, uh, uh, I, I keep forgetting to use the microphone, but I think you know, my voice is loud enough, it, it carries all the way to the end, it's a small room. So that's based on, you know, liquid analysis, okay. On the other hand, the medical community in recent years has been coming up with increasingly, uh, you know, more and more biomarkers in, 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 in human breath, okay. Again, as an engineer a few years ago, when somebody told me that a human breath has got about, I don't know, something like 200, 300 organic compounds, I was astonished. And uh, apparently what it is is some of these organic, I mean, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, constituents of the, um, our breath, uh, uh, they can act like biomarkers. For example, um, acetone in diabetes uh, in a patients, uh, they generally have excess amount of 
acetone in their breath compared to normal population. And people who are going through kidney dialysis they end up having excess amount of ammonia in their breath compared to normal population. So, if you can do gas and vapor analysis again like what is going on here at nanotech because at nanotech there are, a, there are two groups doing gas and vapor analysis you know one is focusing on uh, environmental monitoring like nitric oxide and, uh, and other kind of dirty things in the air. The other group is focusing on you know food safety like looking at uh, things coming out of mangoes or you know whatever, but potentially you can also do biomedical using the same. Uh, setup that they have you know they they just got to uh, do the training of the sensors ok for acetone or for ammonia. So, it is still doable. Um, so, we make uh, um, uh, uh, a, a, a gas of vapor sensor. So, it is a very simple one it is a silicon based approach um, unlike an, uh, the tin oxide nano wires being used at nanotech we use carbon nanotubes and so it enables room temperature operation. So, you do not have to heat it nevertheless we build a uh, you know heater in there just to clean up you know every time when you have to clean up the sensor you can use heating. Um, so, this is like a bus bar electrode and interdigitated fingers and we purify the single wall carbon nanotubes and then we, we do uh, inkjet uh, uh, printing or drop casting. Um, so, the way you do See in when you do biosensor the selectivity is guaranteed by choosing the probe ok, but on the other hand when you do gas and vapor analysis it is electronic nose uh, you know the selectivity um, is not guaranteed by a, uh, by a probe or anything. What it is is the uh, it it functions like uh, ok, uh, how much time did I get 20 30 minutes 25 ok. So, I will finish in a couple of minutes ok. So, the the selectivity is is guaranteed um, you know by doing in a pattern recognition. So, the way we do that is um, I think I will skip that. So, we fabricate uh, 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter chip with 32 sensors 8 here, 8 here, 8 here and 8 here and uh, but not all 32 of them are identical you know some of them have single wall carbon nanotubes pristine, some of them have nanotubes with the palladium, some of them have nanotubes with the you know gold particles. So, they are all different. So, what it is is when you train them the 32 sensors in the lab they give 32 different responses and you save that in your um, in a signal processing chip and you repeat this for various concentrations, various humidity levels and various temperatures and then you later on you use it for you know use a pattern recognition algorithm. So, that is the electronic nose approach you know which is what is going on here at nanotech ok, except this is a much smaller chip with much more number of sensor elements. So, uh, it also because of the carbon nanotubes it is a room temperature sensitivity and it can give better sensitivity. So, this is something that I am hoping to ship to nanotech. So, the, the two groups here uh, one on the uh, food quality and one on the environmental monitoring they both can use these chips. So, um, there were other things that I oh, by the way I just wanted to mention that we have already um, uh, done um, put this uh, the chem sensor chip on an iPhone. We delivered 30 prototype phones to Department of Homeland Security. And also, uh, this chem sensor chip that I talked about, it is the one and only nanotechnology product that has been flown to outer space, ok. Because that chem sensor has been monitoring air quality in the International Space Station, you know, where the crew is uh, hanging around the small place and it monitors the air quality, particularly for formaldehyde, because formaldehyde is something that comes from the tiles and the carpets and other things. And, uh, um, uh, time average over one day is eight, uh, 1 ppm ok. There are no commercial sensors which can pick out formaldehyde 1 ppm. If formaldehyde accumulates it gives you headache and nausea and all of that ok. So, that is something and um, so, I will I'll skip all of these things and I will leave the summary for you to read um, and I will be happy to answer in a few questions. Thank you Professor Mayalpan. So, we have time for a couple of questions, please. Is your uh, analysis uh, purify sample or real sample? That is real, uh, so blood sample, whole uh, blood. Uh, we have done, we have done yeah, both, we have done uh, um, uh, uh, human samples too. 
Yeah. But, uh, uh, but I, as in every case, you know, when you do the human samples, you know, your sensitivity would be somewhat worse. Your goal is to try to uh, get as close as possible, but generally, you know, that, that's very difficult, okay? But the, but the important thing is, even with the uh, human sample, if you can get um, sensitivity, um, a detection limit uh, lower than what the medical community is looking for, then you, you have done it, okay? Yep. Because sometimes we, we always, again, look for uh, things, you know, unrealistic goal. For example, in troponin, uh, I don't see any reason why someone has to look for femtogram per uh, ml or, or, or even picogram per ml, where a nanogram per ml is what I, the medical community is looking yeah, for. You, you uh, only mentioned sensitivity, but specificity, rather, because uh, uh, there can be many uh, cross reactivity, okay? When you use a uh, whole blood in your parallel, you know, sense multi analyzed sensors, huh? cross reactivity between yeah. sensors and sensors. Uh, if you use a uh, whole blood, Specificity, specificity is uh, more problem. What do you mean by a sensor Specific to sensor? Specificity. No, I know, but what yeah. it is, you said sensor you, you to sensor. Nanowire sense, you know, multi analyzed nanowire sensors. Uh, well, multi uh, analysis uh, meaning when you have three by three? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, the three by three, the multi analysis one, we just finished the work about a month ago. I, have, I've, I, I haven't even seen the results yet. Yeah, yeah. More questions? All right, um, let's thank our speaker, okay. Professor Mayapan, again.